to be a panel discussion. And I invite the moderators, Dr. N. Madhusudan Rao from CCMB and Dr. Uday Saxena from Dr. Reddy's Institute of Life Sciences to come on to that dais. Good evening, everybody. First of all, uh, thank you to the Honorable Minister for uh, being here. And, uh, you know, the, the speech that you gave, sir, uh, really uh, crystallizes what this meeting is going to be all about. I thought it was a beautiful speech, very clear and very crisp. So thank you very much for doing that. I think that was very good. Uh, I also want to thank Dr. Rakesh Mishra, uh, as well as Radha and uh, Jyotsana for giving us the opportunity to do this. And importantly to all of you uh, for coming here and being part of this. So uh, I will be the moderator for the evening. And before I do that, let me ask you a question uh, to the audience. How many of you want to be billionaires? Billionaires, very rich. How many of you want to help your fellow Indian beings? Show of hands. Well, so all of you have come to the right session. At the end of this session, we are hopeful that we'll be able to show you a pathway by which some of you, if, if not all of you, can become entrepreneurs, you know, make wealth for yourself, as well as help other uh, human beings in India. So thank you again for coming. <clears throat> uh, the format for today is, first of all, I'm going to invite all the panel discussions one by one, and they will come and take a chair here. Uh, I will briefly introduce them. And then uh, they will speak for about f three to four minutes each on what they think about entrepreneurship. After that, I will ask them a few directed questions. And in the last 15 minutes, we will open this up for uh, audience to ask questions. So we want to finish this in about an hour. Uh, if you have additional questions, you can get hold of the panelists even at dinner and ask them that. All right. So. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce the panelists. The first one I'd like to invite to the stage is Dr. Prem Kumar Reddy. He's a professor of oncology at ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He has made tremendous contribution to cancer biology, founded Journals of Repute, and has several candidate drugs in clinical trials. Welcome, sir. <clears throat> the second one I'd like to invite to the stage is Dr. S. Ramaswamy who is a senior professor at INSTEM and also founding deans of INSTEM. He was also founding CEO of uh, CCAMP and uh, the Bangalore BioCluster, which has made major impact as an incubator of novel ideas in biotech. So welcome, sir, and thank you for coming. The next on the list uh, is uh, Dr. Ashok Venkit Raman. He is the Ursula Zollner Professor of Cancer Research and Director of Medical Research Council Cancer Unit at University of Cambridge. <laughs> Widely recognized for his contributions to understanding the genetics and biology of cancer. So welcome, sir. Uh, the next one is uh, Dr. Deidre Kuhn, uh, found, who founded Glycan Biosciences and serves as its uh, Chief Scientific Officer and Executive Director. Currently, she is the head of uh, molecular immunology group at Curtin University in Australia. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, last, uh, the one next to that is Dr. Gayatri Saberwal. She is Dean Academic Affairs at Institute of Bioinformatics and Applied Biotechnology in Bangalore. Uh, she analyzes entrepreneurship and clinical trials in India with a view to help policy formulation. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, last but not the least is Dr. Raghu Kaluri. He's a chairman and professor of the Department of Cancer Biology and the director of metastasis research at University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Thank you very much for coming. He's also an entrepreneur himself. And just to let you know, I checked all their bank accounts. All of them are billionaires, by the way. Very successful entrepreneurs and billionaires. So uh, I think this is going to be a very exciting session. Uh, what is exciting for me to see is so many young people, as the minister spoke, I think this is really the, the strength that we have. I see so many young scientists here in the room eager to learn about entrepreneurship, you know. When my father, he worked at ISCT, 
He did the same job for 50 years. He joined the lab and then retired from there. Why? Because he couldn't take the risk. There were no mechanisms for him. He was brilliant. I mean, he had ideas he could commercialize. Why did he not do it? Because he couldn't take the risk. I think the government, the environment today that the government has created is fantastic. I mean, the minister spoke about BIRAC. There are many programs for young people to take the risk, as I call it. You know, risk taking ability is critical to being entrepreneur. You cannot hope for a safe job, you know, in academia and say, I, I want to do that as well as I want to be an entrepreneur. It doesn't work that way. So it's amazing that the government has now created many vehicles for us, for the young people today to take risk and enter into uh, entrepreneurship. So truly a fantastic time for India right now, I think. I, I truly believe that. It reminds me a lot of the 80s and 90s in the US. And, and the minister spoke about that too where you know we had companies like Amgen, Genentex, Vertex being spun out of academia. I see a lot of that happening in India now. I think all we need is one successful story, you know, one successful biotech company if we can launch product. I think we just need one Amitabh Bachchan in this industry. If they have that, I think we are on the right track. So with that introduction, uh, I'm going to start the, the session now. As I said, the session is to educate the young people here about what it takes to be an entrepreneur as a scientist. You know, why did people, these people get into it? What did they do? Why were they successful? I mean, things that you probably wonder about all the time. I'm trying to tease out some of these things from this, uh, uh, from this expert panel that we have today. So, Madhu, do I continue to stand here, or uh, is there a mic for me to go sit there and talk, or? Uh, yeah, okay, I, I can, you know. You'll have to pay me after this, but I can stand and do this too, so that's fine. Uh, I have a, a list of, we actually circulated a list of questions uh, to the experts. Uh, I'm gonna try and deviate a little bit from that. First of all, I'd like each of them to spend about two minutes telling us what got you attracted towards either being a student of entrepreneurship or being an entrepreneur or thinking about a biotech industry. So if you can just kind of spend two minutes of your time uh, starting from Raghu, maybe, because he's not making eye contact with me, so I'll have Raghu do that first. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm um, honored by this invitation and uh, to be part of this uh, amazing panel, and I have to concur with you that the Honorable Minister's uh, speech was quite uh, inspiring, but also quite uh, contextual, and I think it was a very context-dependent speech about how one must think about innovation and biotech with respect to economics and excellence and science and serving the people. I think if you don't mix them together, then you don't get a successful uh, biotech uh, you know, entrepreneurship developing in India. So I really appreciated that. I believe that examples uh, start with yourselves. So let me tell you a bit about how I uh, was involved in uh, becoming an entrepreneur of sorts. And I say that because I truly actually believe that you can be an academic, be a professor in a university, have a research program, and be an entrepreneur. And the reason for that is because when I was a graduate student, it became very clear to me that the world was changing around me. And that many of the things that we were doing anymore had to be applied. You couldn't do science anymore thinking that you're just learning about the body and not thinking about how that has an application towards uh, you know, potential commercialization or potential benefit to people. And so I participated in discussions with people who are running companies. And when I became a postdoctoral fellow, I had the opportunity to found my first company with my mentor and few others. And I think that taught me how to really take the science we were doing in the laboratory and think about its uh, commercial potential and, uh, and uh, form a biotech company. And then when I s continued that journey and went to University of Pennsylvania, I had an opportunity to stay in a building with all Wharton students. And so I was the only science person in a building with all Wharton students, and it became very quickly possible to learn about their way of thinking, and I realized that their education was nothing but networking. 
All they would do most of the time is meet people, talk to them, and create network because that's the key component of having a successful business. Because you need to know people, people need to know you, and you need to make connections. And so what I call is that's how I got my street MBA. Never went to an MBA, but really from just hanging around people. And then when I became an assistant professor at Harvard, uh, when we started our research program, I never thought about anything uh, as being a professor means that you just do science. Everything we did had to be innovative. Everything we did had to be new. We wanted to discover. But when you do that, you automatically are an entrepreneur. So you don't have to think differently. You run your entire life thinking about how to invent, how to execute, how to take it to the next level. And that's exactly what you do in business. So uh, within my year and a half as an assistant professor, I was able to start my first company as a faculty, along with two other faculty there. And this company uh, was bought by Ilex Oncology, which then let us all work together as Ilex and bring CD52 antibody that some of you may know in cancer uh, is a drug that's available for uh, CLL now. And so this, this led us to then a journey of doing science that I've done. I've always been a professor. I've always been a faculty member. But running a laboratory that always was an engine for innovation because when you think you want to discover something, as some of the people in the podium have done, and when you think you want to do uh, breakthrough science, you want to lead the science, then you will have discoveries in hand that will become commercially viable and become entrepreneurial. And so over the period, we uh, did a couple more companies. And recently, I want to end with you giving an example. I moved to MD Anderson about three, four years ago uh, from Harvard and uh, began a new research program. And within two years, we actually were able to take all of our laboratory findings and find investors and start a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Kodiak Biosciences. And in two years of starting the company, it has raised $170 million through investors. And I'm telling you this not because of that aspect that I wanted to be, to, to be here and be uh, you know, impressed by, but the fact that all of that science came from students, postdoctoral fellows, and technicians in the laboratory. Just doing their science and publishing it, and then that science becoming something valuable to start a company. So I just want to share that personal experience with you that entrepreneurship is something that is uh, in you. It's always in you, and you just have to find it. And when you find it, you just have to be brave enough to accept that you be doing whatever you're doing every moment of your life, you're an entrepreneur. And by doing that, then you're able to really uh, you know, foster a world of generating these sort of biotech companies. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, Raghu. I think that was quite inspirational to hear as to how you got started as an academic and spun out companies. Um, you know, uh, I must apologize, I forgot to uh, introduce myself. So I'm Uday Saxena. I'm actually a professor of translational research at Dr. Reddy's Institute of Life Sciences. Uh, I have uh, never been in academia. I've spent 30 years in the industry. Uh, some of you may have heard of the drug called Lipitor or Atorvastatin. Uh, it's a cholesterol-lowering drug. I was part of the team that discovered that. So I'm, I'm fully aware of how you know, this business of science and commercialization works. So, and my partner in this crime is Dr. Madhu Sudhan Rao, who is CEO of the incubator at CCMB. Madhu is a very shy guy, you know, I don't know where he is, but, uh, so he, he's done most of the work, so I want to acknowledge that as well. So the next person I'd like to invite on stage and um, talk about their experience for about two minutes is uh, Gayatri. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll take a slightly different tack from perhaps all the other speakers on this panel because I've never formed a company. Uh, my, I, I research companies, or rather I research the sector, the biotech and pharma sector, from different angles. Uh, and a little bit about how it came about. Um, I was an early employee of a, an institute whose mandate it is to help grow the biotech industry in India, uh, IBAB in Bangalore. And as part of the uh, initial work of, you know, sort of setting up the institute and raising funds, uh, I happened to write a grant application to promote entrepreneurship. And we won it. This was to a private foundation uh, in the U.S., the Wadhwani Foundation. Uh, as part of the involvement with the Wadhwani Foundation, a professor from INSEAD, Singapore, which is a business school originally based in France, came and visited us 
And he asked me, so who's forming the biotech companies in India? And so I sort of said, well, the postdocs aren't doing much. And, you know, I gave him an answer. And by the end of the day, I realized that that could be a paper, that one analyzed who is forming the companies. So that got accepted. And I suddenly realized that I was a policy researcher. Um, now, the problem was, this was uh, in the mid-2000s, that um, it's not so easy to analyze the industry. Industry is quite closed. And there, there are not large databases or lots of data on what's happening in India. So I turned to the US, where the US Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO, uh, the US FDA, the US Food and Drug Administration, and clinicaltrials.gov, which is an NIH site, have ample data, all freely available. So you can pose a question and download lakhs of records and you know, analyze it. So we did several studies of that sort. So entrepreneurship in India, by and large, I have done by means of interviews. But other policy-related uh, work has been through such databases. So this might be of interest to young people who may not want to do biology alone going forward, who may have an interest in policy research. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff I've done, which might be of interest to them. Thank you very much, Gayatri. Yeah, you know, one of the things about this whole business of biotech and entrepreneurship, I mean, it appears like it's madness, but there's a method to the madness. And we need people like Gayatri to be able to understand and unravel that and, you know, uh, tell us about how we can do it systematically. I mean, the one thing we don't do very well in India is follow a process. So we, we need people like you. Thank you. Uh, Deidre, may I request you to give your two minutes of uh, uh, how you became an entrepreneur, please? Well, I'm, I'm going to disappoint everybody and say I don't really feel like an entrepreneur. Okay. <laughs> and, but I must thank the organisers for inviting me to take part in this panel. And I have, feel an enormous responsibility for the other people in Australia who, in fact, are probably far more entrepreneurial than what I am. So I thank you for your, your kind invitation. But just to let you know how I managed to get involved in this process, um, at the time, I think I felt I was stark raving crazy. I think the people in my lab thought I was stark raving crazy, but I'm still doing it. And now it's a long time ago. I span out the company originally in 2006 and now it's 2018, and we're still going, we're still making progress, we're still trying to get our drugs through um, all the stages, and hopefully, uh, before I die, there will be one of my products out there helping people and helping them in a way that a lot of the current compounds that are on the market are not able to do. I just want to make another point. I think people who run a research lab for a large number of years are in fact learning all about running a business because to run a research lab successfully and certainly in Australia where I've spent most of my time, you have to run it like a business because if you don't, you won't have the money to keep your, your research assistants and your postdocs or even the money to keep your students in your laboratory. You need to be forward thinking, you need to look out for the grants that you need to apply for, and you need to know, most importantly, how to manage risk. And that is all part of running and making a successful biotech startup. You do it in your labs every day. Your mentors, your supervisors are doing it. So it's not such a big step. But having said that, when I spun out my company, I was involved in a very uh, vertical learning curve. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to understand. It's not the same as doing basic academic research. Would I do it again? Absolutely. Is it exciting? You bet it is. Do you get lots of vibes when things work well? even more than what you do when your experiments work in the lab. So if you want an exciting career, go for it. Thank you very much, Deirdre. I think she said a lot of uh, very important things in, in becoming from an academic to an entrepreneur.
But I can tell you one of the things that is often mistaken is, you know, you might be doing beautiful science. For example, you may have discovered a new gene that enhances the longevity of C. elegans, for example. You know, unfortunately, and you might have published it in Science or Nature or, you know, any highly cited journal. But unfortunately, that does not translate or guarantee translation to a product because it's not an unmet need. Aging is not recognized as a disease. So the FDA or Food and Drug Administration would never allow you a product to use that gene to enhance life. So one of the important decisions you have to make, and I think Deidre mentioned that, is you have to, your product or your science has to be applied to an unmet medical need. Producing another aspirin, while it's good to make a paper, but it's not going to be commercially viable. But if you have the new product towards Alzheimer's, now that's an unmet need. So very important early on to understand that good science does not necessarily mean good product. Good science has to be applied to an unmet medical need. All right. So the next one uh, I'm going to invite is Ashok. Ashok, if you can spend a couple of minutes, please. Thank you. Um You'll have heard already from the uh, people who have preceded me that entrepreneurship is clearly a very broad church. It encompasses many different types of people, different personalities, and above all, different motivations. Anyone can become an entrepreneur, and I feel that what motivated me was simply, as they put it, what I perceived to be an unmet need. I had no intention of going down this route, um, I worked with a number of different major pharmaceutical companies, Cambridge Antibody Technology, AstraZeneca, Aztecs, and there grew in me a sense that, look, maybe there were different ways, more efficient ways, perhaps less expensive ways to get jobs in drug discovery done. And that was my motivation for developing new technologies and spinning them out into different companies. I think what's important to recognize, to reiterate what Uday just said, is that innovation by itself is insufficient. You also need to be able to conceive what an endpoint may be and to deliver that endpoint through an effective and efficient plan of business. Without this, your idea will never attract the investment it needs to flourish. Perhaps the aspirin example that Uday gave is a case in point to show that entrepreneurship and new ideas can flourish everywhere. Uday used aspirin to say, look, there's not much point in replacing aspirin, but as a clinician and someone who's actually suffered from the side effects of aspirin, I would say that if anyone can discover an anti-inflammatory of the aspirin class that doesn't induce bleeding, for example, there's a huge unmet medical need. And it illustrates the point that these types of ideas are where you need to begin. But from those beginnings, you then need to develop a plan to deliver something that people will invest in. The last few seconds, I just want to touch on a point that I alluded to earlier, personal motivation. My experience has been that people become entrepreneurs for many different reasons. And has been noticed, noted early, I mean, there's no shame in wanting to make money, for example, from entrepreneurship. But equally, I think there's no shame in actually wanting to be an entrepreneur in order to make things happen differently, to make things better, and to have a social impact. And I know that when we were starting up companies, myself and some of my colleagues, it became very hard to attract investment into some of our platform companies because we set out at the outset to say we want to do drug discovery in a different way, through a cooperative model. We still feel that this has the potential to return on investment, but it is not going to be a one-shot uh, um, shop in other words, discover one product, sell out to a bigger company and move on, but rather something that develops into a business. And many investors were totally put off by that. We persisted 
And I guess the message I want to leave you with is have the courage of your convictions because there is the opportunity, whatever your motivations, to start a business, to become an entrepreneur, there is room to succeed. Thank you very much, Ashok. I think, as you can tell by the response, it was quite inspirational. You know, one other difference between academia and becoming a biotech company, I mean, we talked about unmet medical need. Not all good science can translate into a product, so that's one. The other is, you know, you need teamwork. I, I think in academia, you are pretty much uh, geared towards building a silo. You are the PI, you have your students, you have, you know, your postdocs. And, you know, in most cases, the interaction between other labs is very limited. In the industry setting, if you want to be an entrepreneur, it's quite the opposite. You have to recognize you don't have all the skills necessary. I think to recognize an unmet need, you'll need a physician on board. So you have to get hold of a physician pretty quickly and say, yeah, here's my idea. You think you'll be able to use this in your clinical practice. And, and, and the other thing is um, you have to hold hands with industry. You know, this process of biotech and entrepreneurship and getting a product on the market is highly regulated. Believe me, it's as if not more regulated than becoming a pilot because you're dealing with human lives. So it's important that as an academic entrepreneur, please you know, collaborate very quickly with a physician as well as somebody from the industry who has gone, gone through the process. So teamwork is very, very important if you want to be successful. The next person uh, I am delighted to uh, you know, invite to say uh, for two minutes is Dr. Prem Kumar Reddy, please. Okay, uh, I think the rest of the speakers have said everything that need to be said. But actually today one student asked me a question which actually made me think a little. He said, why is biotech industry so successful in the United States? And actually, so come to think about it, a major change has occurred in drug development industry in the United States and in the world for the, in the last 20 years. So 20 years ago when I started, uh, uh, you know, working on drug development, majority of the drug development work was being done in pharmaceutical, major pharmaceutical companies, Merck, Novartis, Johnson & Johnson, and other places where, who had huge infrastructure to recruit scientists, to do research on drug development, and to validate their results. But what happened about more than 20 years ago is this tremendous explosion of knowledge in basic sciences, which was actually done in academic institutions. People began understanding the molecular basis of a disease. And the experts, suddenly about a disease, you know, expertise on the disease itself shifted to academic researchers. So it is these people who identified genes, who identified signaling pathways, and uh, who had the capability to think, hey, looks like I have found a discovery. And maybe this, is, this discovery should be the basis of a drug development project. And, uh, you know, 30 years ago doing applied research, what we call today as translational research, was a stigma in basic sciences and in academia. It completely disappeared with this revolution that occurred. And people started thinking about applying their work uh, or translating their work to human use. So uh, what happened was the evolution of biotech industry, uh, many of which failed, but a few succeeded. And over a period of time, what happened, which is amazing to me, is major pharmaceutical industry stopped doing research, basic research on drug development or finding targets. It's all being today done in, in academic world. And, and it's actually even more amazing, major pharma no longer develop drugs. 
So it is the small biotech company started by entrepreneurs who mainly come from academic institutions, develop drugs, and a pharma then goes and buys that company and then markets it. So essentially today Merck has become a marketing company rather than a drug development company. So I think this kind of an opportunity awaits for all Indian biologists and chemists and scientists. Think I want to do fundamental research, understand a disease at the molecular level, try to find out every gene that is involved in it, and try to think, now you are doing SIRNAs to knock down the, you know, the function of a gene and telling us that you can affect the progression of this disease. So think about colleagues who can help you, or chemists who can help you design a small molecule that can inhibit or replace the function of the siRNA. And then you have a starting point. Beautiful. I think that 100,000 foot view you gave was fantastic. You know, the one other difference um, I'd like to share with you uh, in the industry is the rigor of science that the industry really wants. So, you know, in, when you publish a paper, there needs to be an end of, you know, three experiments, whatever. But when the industry wants to license something from an academic, uh, the due diligence that we do is very different. I mean, the, what we really want to see is, is it too good to be true? And we don't like ideas that have data that appears to be too good to be true. So when you spin out your company and look for partnership with the industry, make sure that the rigor of science that you use is at a much higher level than the rigor that you use for maybe publishing a paper because the due diligence that's done, when somebody wants to put $10 million on your idea, you can imagine what kind of due diligence. So just be careful about the rigor that goes into looking at an idea before an industry wants to partner with an academic institution. Uh, last but not the least, I'm going to request Ram to uh, please uh, say a few words for the next two minutes. Uh, I first want to thank Jyotsna for getting me to come here. Uh, and I wondered why she wanted me in this panel. Uh, I'm probably for the only reason that Jyotsna invites me to anything that is to be provocative. Uh, so I, uh, I'm not going to talk about myself. I'm going to take the fifth on that. But... Uh, over the last, since 2009, uh, I've been working at the Center for Cellular and Molecular Platforms, and today there are about 50 companies that incubate there. Many of them have come and gone through. And what I'm hoping today is to share the experiences, the, uh, the failures, the successes uh, of all of these uh, uh, companies, the troubles they went through, uh, the mentorings they needed, so uh, I'm hoping that I can share those experiences with you and just not mine. And I'm gonna end by being very provocative. I'm gonna say there is this complete misconception among Indian biologists and including many in this table. Somehow we have equated biotech innovation to drug discovery. The total amount of money that biotech generates it's only a small fraction that is coming from uh, pharma. Uh, the biggest biotech company in India is Haldirams. They will put many biotech companies in the globe to shame. Uh, if uh, we focus on pharma as the sole biotech, India should stop doing this. There is so many, I'm not saying we should not do pharma. I think it should be a very small sector, the same size as the global biotech sector. Uh, food, uh, nutrition, uh, agriculture, uh, environment, uh, every place you can think of, uh, biotech can have an influence. And my advice to any youngster who has come through us has been, don't touch pharma. And I'll tell you why. Unless it's really unique, maybe diagnostics, but not pharma, uh, for a variety of reasons. So I'm happy to share my experiences, but I thought I should start by fulfilling the role for which Jotsna called me by being provocative. Thank you. I mean, that was a very nice analogy. 
when you said you were going to be provocative, I thought you were going to say Virat Kohli should no longer be the captain of India. So I'm so happy you didn't say that. <laughs> But uh, I think I'll move on to the next part of our uh, thing, where I am going to ask each of you individually a question. Uh, we'll do that for the next 15 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor for questions. I'd like to end by 8.40 and go get our beers or drinks or whatever. So, uh, Firstly, Raghu, I'd, I'd like to ask you, uh, how do you decide which idea should you spin out? I mean, you're obviously working on 10 different projects. Well, what's that? You know, how do you pick the gem? Well, thank you. Uh, first, I want to congratulate you. You're a great moderator. So I think you <laughs> are, you. you're setting up the questions really well in your comments. So I think that's a great question. And as you said, um, that uh, you have to know what is the unmet need. You have to know what triggers people's interest. So I would say the way we recognize this uh, is driven by the science we do. We mainly do science to discover new things, new, uh, you know, try to go where nobody else is going with respect to some aspect of biology that, that, that interests us, but also has, an idea, has a way to get into a, a translational mode. So I would say that none of the students or postdocs or anybody works thinking that it'll become an idea that'll go to biotech. This is not our goal. We are academics. But the science we do as it evolves will just let us know. It will just, people will recognize it, and you will know it. And when you know it, it just has its own way of being recognized as going towards something that could be a part of a biotech startup. So I think we, 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 we I cannot tell you that we start by thinking that versus sure. going for the unknown, going for things that, uh, you know, for example, I work with something called exosomes. And we went into the field about five years ago because we felt there's a lot of biology that needs to be done. And we just went in this brand new area. And by doing that, things evolved, which became a company. But we didn't go to it thinking we'll start a company. I hope that answers your question. No, that's beautiful. I think that's very well said. And I think the young people will have an understanding of, you know, serendipity and, you know, keeping a prepared mind appears to be very important in, in moving forward innovative ideas towards business looks like so. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Gayatri, you had mentioned that you do a lot of, uh, you know, you've studied the U.S. Uh, biotech model and data from all that. Um, do you have, uh, you know, one or two recommendations from your learnings there for the Indian biotech? I mean, I talked about rigor, you know, as being an example of how we should be more rigorous, but, you know, more profound ideas than what I just... If, do you have a couple of things that you think from the U.S. we could borrow and that, that could, you know, help us? I'd actually say what we shouldn't borrow. Sure. Okay. Um, so there's been this idea that um, very deep science, innovative science, leads to very expensive products. So in the U.S. you have these astronomically high-priced drugs. Um, and I'll give an example. Uh, gene therapy, uh, there's been a gene therapy approved in the U.S., and the price is something like a million dollars for a person. Um, I met uh, someone in Bangalore who is developing, who is ready to do gene therapy. They're not yet in trials. And that person told me that at most it would cost $10,000 per patient if you excluded the capital expenditure. So it just seemed to me that, okay, he's not yet there, but you bring in half a dozen US patients and charge them half a million dollars and you cover all your capital expenditure and you then can roll out gene therapy for $10,000 each. I'll give you another example where uh, Dr. Yusuf Hamid of CIPLA, yeah. who brought down the price of AIDS drugs uh, way back, has said in print, that he thinks he can bring out a biologic for a dollar a day. And I have had an entrepreneur in Bangalore tell me that he could do it for even less. So I think uh, we are sometimes inhibited by the huge prices of innovation in the US and think that all of that is unaffordable to us. Yeah. But the way innovation is happening in India, both the innovation part and the manufacturing part, I think we can afford all of that 
at much lower costs if we do it in India. So I would say we need to, I don't know whether we modify how we fund it, or whether it's price, price controls, or whether it's promoting competition, or what it is, but we have to think of the different ways by which we can bring down the price of innovate, innovative science-driven discoveries and developments. Excellent. You know, the word Indian jugar comes to my mind, and I'm pretty sure that we'll be able to apply the Indian jugar to what you're saying, but uh, I mean, you know, the big difference between having charging high rates for medicines in the U.S. is there's managed health care there. The insurance companies make sure that, you know, they put, a, uh, they put a lid on that. But we don't have that. We are still not developed enough. So affordability is a, going to be a very important uh, part of how we move forward in the biotech industry in this country, I think. But thank you very much. Um, Deidre, I, you know, um, it almost seems to me like you got into this purely out of passion and being a billionaire wasn't really your ambition, but have there been times where you said enough is enough, I want to give, back, give this all up and go back and just be a, a professor and have my students? I mean, what is making you keep going like this? That, that is a really interesting question because as the people in, in my institute will know, I often say that I've had enough, I can't stand this anymore. But what keeps me going is, I'm, is, is the passion with my science. I think the molecules that we are making are going to be able to make a difference. And unlike people who become an entrepreneur because they want to make lots of money, that's not why I do it. I do it because I, I would, would, you know, I would be absolutely delighted if one of my compounds was in the clinic and helping people. And some of the molecules that we're making are designed, we hope, to do away with nasty things like corticosteroids. And it comes back to your asthma, uh, aspirin example again. I mean, okay, these drugs work, and they work most of the time quite effectively, but they do all kinds of nasty things to us at the same time. And I don't want to do that. And I also want to make something that is affordable, not just for people that have lots of money, or in the Western world, people who can afford health insurance. So we aim to produce compounds that work, that are affordable, and hopefully don't have the toxic side effects that some of the other drugs that are currently on the market do have. So I guess I'm not sure if that's answered your question, but no, I, I think it, becomes, it becomes a drug. It's something you keep doing because you just desperately want to see um, the outcome. And in my case, I'm doing it for those reasons, not to get mega bucks in the bank because I don't think I ever will. <laughs> so it's the obsession, really. Yes. You're obsessed with that idea. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ashok, um, I, you know, you mentioned you've spun out uh, ideas into companies. Uh, what's your approach to raising funds, being in academia? How are you funding all this? I mean, that's the, the first challenge as anybody, as you know, will have is, yeah, the idea is great, but who's going to pay for this? So how are you doing it? So uh, I should say at the outset that the way that um, I've approached this is not necessarily the way lots of people do. So there is a caveat there. Uh, but like Deirdre, I've sort of been inspired by trying to do things differently, and I mentioned this at the outset. So the spin-outs that we have done in Cambridge have taken a rather unusual track compared to most uh, spin-outs, because as I also mentioned earlier, the idea has been to meet an unmet need by doing something differently, more effectively, hopefully delivering a more effective, cheaper, safer product. So they're platform companies rather than product companies per se. And the tack we have taken is really that we want to build a sustainable business, not a one product business. Um, someone referred earlier to the, uh, I think Prem referred to the idea that a lot of biotech develop one drug, sell out to Merck or whoever, and that's the end of that company. Everybody has realized their ambition. So. That isn't the motivation for what 
we have been doing in Cambridge. And I say this because these are caveats. I'm not saying that my experience can be generalized. But to answer your question with those caveats, what we have done is to start with angel investment. Cambridge in the UK is extremely fortunate in having a whole network of people, some ex-academics, but many who have never been academics, who have made money through entrepreneurship, through companies. And rather than simply use that money for themselves, they reinvest in small businesses. And my colleagues and I have found these types of angels are extremely good to work with. They've been through it. They bring to the boards of companies a lot of experience about how the mistakes to avoid and how to go about doing this. And frankly, I hope there are no venture capitalists sitting in the audience. <laughs> but the moment you take in venture capital, you're on a ride. You're being driven to produce something in a very short time frame and just do whatever it takes. And sometimes, especially at an early stage, things fail because the science is not quite up to the point when it can be driven in that way. So we've taken the route of taking in angel investment yep. in small amounts, having very clearly defined milestones. The second difference in our approach has been with each of our platform companies design from the outset a modest income generating stream mm -hmm. that goes alongside the angel investment. So not only do we start setting up our science and moving it in different directions, but that itself generates income through small deals, for example, with a larger pharma. Um, an example is the company that we have just spun out foremost, which is using a new technology, which we call protein interference, developed in my lab as a new rapid and more effective way of identifying the best targets, we think, in any given molecular pathway. And the income has come very quickly because Big Pharma have recognized the opportunity to apply this technology to their problems at relatively low cost and risk to them. But the income from these deals then funds the in-house science within the company. So those two tactics, which is don't go in for huge investments at the outset, because you're going to be pushed, pushed, pushed to deliver something quickly, go slowly, take in an angel investment, and try to design income streams, Very early. which is possible with technology platform-based companies, not so easy with product-driven companies. That helps you to really, I think, create what's my ambition and that of my colleagues, a sustainable business. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I just want to say that risk is a very big part of this business. So as Ashok, I think, very elegantly said, if you can find ways to either de-risk or delay the risk and, and not have big spend up front, I think that helps a lot. So thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Prem, uh, you probably know the US science and the Indian science as well as anybody else. Uh, can you think of what would be an ideal product for India right now? I mean, obviously gene therapy is a long shot maybe, but are you thinking diagnostics or marriage of IT and biotech or what do, where do you think we should start as young entrepreneurs? Uh, that's a tough question to <laughs> answer. That's why I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I still, you know, coming from the biology side, I'm a cancer biologist by training. And, and I'm actually very delighted when I was walking through the posters to see the quality of the work that, you know, people are doing now in India in various That's labs. Great. And, uh, you know, what it tells me is there are going to be fantastic discoveries, basic discoveries that will be made in Indian labs. And these discoveries will be done by people who are not ashamed of doing translational research anymore. And, uh, and they will be able to figure out ways of using their discovery in, into developing a new product, whether it's a biological molecule, whether it's a small molecule, and the only advice I give you all is try to be as collaborative as possible. 
When you want to develop a drug, don't go and try to do it yourself. There are chemists and pharmacologists around you, and if one cannot do it or doesn't want to do it, go to the next person, the next person, and the next person. You will be very successful. The basis of all good drugs is going to be the basic research that you are doing now. True. Excellent. Totally agree with that. Thank you very much for your comment here. Beautiful, yeah. Uh, Ram, you know, you've been in leadership positions in Indian science, and so I'd like to understand from you, do you see any major gaps from Indian scientists becoming successful entrepreneurs? Are, are you, do you think there's any obvious gaps, whether it's funding or policy or whatever, since you've been in leadership positions, I think. Oh, God, I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have two minutes. So. <laughs> I have two minutes. So I'll tell you, to me, um, the biggest problem in India today is uh, decision-making uh, by stakeholders, conflict of interest management. Every decision in Indian policy government system, they make sure in the guise of conflict of interest never to have a stakeholder make a decision. Mm. Right? Uh, so now when a stakeholder does not make a decision and I have no stake in the decision I make, I make poor decisions. Yeah. An enormous number of poor decisions have been made in the Indian context in being able to leverage our academic science into entrepreneurship because of the constant fear of uh, uh, being accused of conflict of interest. Mm. Instead of trying to manage conflict of interest, we have tried to avoid conflict of interest, nixing Indian academia, translating these things. Mm. And this important cultural change, mm. attitude change, will dramatically allow translation a capability of Indian academics and Indian institutions to bring things to the market. Very well said. Yeah, thank you. Very well said, yeah. Um, so I, I think that was beautiful. Please give them a hand for, you know, some very insightful comments.